to start this out. Welcome everybody to another town hall. This one is very special to Neil and I because it is multifamily acquisitions and debt. Something that keeps us up at night uh, as multifamily owners. So it's a, a different world that we're living in. And we are here with some experts today, not just on the debt side, but we love that we've got an acquisitions expert here with us too. So without further ado, I'm going to have Nick, Paul, and then Fritz, and lead, finishing off with Neil, please give us a 30-second intro, and then we'll go right into questions. Let's start with Nick. Great. Well, first of all, thanks for, uh, for having me this evening. It's, uh, it's good to have any interaction with uh, people that, that we can have right now, uh, and, and I, I miss people, so this is great. Um, I, uh, my name is Nick Flewellen, and I am uh, managing senior managing director at Marcus and Millichap here in the Dallas area. I run a large team of uh, 15 people, and we're focused really on this entire region. But uh, the lion's share of our business is in in Texas, uh, you know, DFW, East Texas, West Texas, Central Texas, um, and primarily on Class B and Class C multifamily. Um, and, you know, that, I mean, that's, you know, on, on a nutshell, that's, that's what we do. We, we do some newer stuff in some of the secondary and tertiary markets, but, but our bread and butter is B and C workforce housing. Awesome. Let's go to Paul. Well, good afternoon to everybody. And I'm glad, glad to see that uh, Fritz and uh, Nick have shaved for this, uh, <laughs> this, this wonderful event, because as you can probably imagine, a lot of us haven't shaved for at least a couple of weeks. Yeah. So, so my name is Paul Peebles. I'm with Old Capital. Maybe people probably have heard of the Old Capital podcast. I host that, that with uh, Mr. Michael Becker. And so that is downloaded about 4,500 to 5,000 times a day. And so we give you up-to-date information. So I've known Neil and Anna for, for, for some time. Yep. Uh, in fact, Neil has been on our, our podcast in the past. And uh, so I've done this for 35 years. I'm a banker by trade. I've closed 5,700 commercial loans. We close about a billion dollars a year in commercial real estate, over a billion dollars. About 80 to 85% of the business that we do are apartments. The rest that we close is like new construction and value-added and stabilized apartments. And the rest are stabilized office and retail and warehouse and some mobile home parks. So uh, that's what I do. And we are excited to have Fritz Waldvogel on too. Thank you so much for saying the name for me, by the yeah, way. Yeah, he I'm is. I'm learning um, still, Fritz. I'll, I'll get it. I'll get it. He, he is our bonus to bring on because, bonus. yeah, uh, he wasn't uh, supposed to come on, but I, I bent his arm a little bit and got him to come on because he is an expert uh, in multifamily financing with um, Fannie Mae. Mm -hmm. And so he, he is a dust lender which stands for Delegated Underwriter Servicer. There's 25 of them in the United States. And he works for a company called Doherty Mortgage. Doherty Mortgage is based out of Minneapolis. Well, I keep talking. So Fritz, take it from yeah, here. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah. So hello, everyone. My name is Fritz Waldvogel. I'm with uh, Doherty Mortgage. Great to see everybody. And thanks for, uh, for having me on this uh, group chat. Um, as Paul said, I'm with Doherty Mortgage. We're in, um, I'm based in Minneapolis, but we lend all across the country and focus on, my primary focus is on Fannie Mae and, and HUD transactions. Um, so I think with, uh, it's always good to have these discussions. I think with all the volatility going on in the markets and a lot of questions on the asset management side, um, we're getting a lot of questions. So I think getting everyone on a group call makes, makes a lot of sense. Yep. Yeah. Neil, you want to give a little intro for us? Yep. Um, so Anna and I um, are, we run two companies, Grow Capitalist and Multifamily U. Um, multifamily value add, multifamily new construction, student housing, value add and new construction, also public storage, about a $250 million portfolio. I think most of us, most of you on the call know us fairly well. Um, and uh, today we're really interested in, in hearing from these experts about what's happening in the marketplace. And, and, and folks, you know, I'd love to go beyond multifamily. I know, I know that the people that are on there, the 515 people on there, all, almost all of them believe in multifamily, but it's nice to actually also talk about other asset classes. So don't, feel, don't be afraid to, to drift from multifamily um, and to some of the other asset classes so that we can see what, what the rest of the market is feeling when you talk about both on the, the, you know, both the acquisition side and the debt side. So, okay, welcome. so 
So we are going to follow the following format. We've got a bunch of pre, uh, some great questions that we got together before this. We're gonna go through those questions. I'm gonna shift them around to different people. If you have questions from the audience, which we encourage, I want you to put them in the Q&A box. It gets too messy and confusing in the chat box, really hard to follow. So please put your Q&A in the, the Q&A box mm -hmm. and we will get to those at the 45 or 60 minute and just uh, do only live questions from there. So with that, I am going to start out with Nick. Uh, so Nick, what is Marcus and Milichap seeing out there in terms of buyer activity? Um, tell, tell me your, your story about volumes, prices, retrades. What's going on? Yeah, well, um, you know, all we can do, obviously, right now is, is be on the phone and, and talk with investors, you know, pretty much all day long. And that's, that's basically what I've been doing for the last couple of weeks. And Great. You know, so, I, so, so you don't know anything about this. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> nobody wants to talk to that to me right now. No, I'm, uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, I, I, you know, look, I'm, I'm a, as positive of a, of a person as it gets in the world. Not just, uh, that's the way I try to always be, but you know, like it's a difficult time right now. It's unprecedented. I've, I've been doing this since 2004. So I, I was right in the middle of the trenches, uh, in the last run up and then in the last recession and then coming out of that. So I I've seen, um, I've seen, you know, the bad times. Um, th this is obviously different. It hit us extremely quickly. Um, yeah. The market was on fire. All the fundamentals were amazing. And then all of a sudden, you know, you go to sleep and, and the world has changed yeah. overnight. And so that that is very unique and unusual. And um, I think what, what happened is all of a sudden overnight, you, all the variables that happen in every single transaction got murky. You know, nobody knew how to price the risk. And so unless the deal was almost at the finish line and, and actually Fritz and I had one that was literally 24 hours or less from closing that wow. still didn't, that still didn't make. Um, oh, you got the pens you know, in the hand, right? The, the, and it's like, the, the, where, where's the, the lender? Was, the pen was in the hand. Like everybody that. was, was ready. But, but, you know, as it, as it turned out, the equity partner uh, on that deal uh, was heavily invested in hotels and their mm. portfolio went from, very high occupancy to almost no occupancy almost overnight. So, so you, you know, you're seeing that sort of thing. I talked to another guy today. Um, he was in escrow uh, on a deal, a twenty-two and a half million dollar deal. He said, "I'm not, I'm not going to keep moving. You can keep my earnest money. I'm, I'm backing out." They went back to him and said, "Hey, I'll discount uh, the property uh, by a million and a half dollars." He said, "No, I still can't do it." They went back to the five next buyers that they had, and uh, and those five buyers all said, you know, most of them said, "I'm not going to offer," and one did, and that offer was eighteen and a half million dollars. So, so I, how, I just, how much of a discount did that, that was that off the original yeah. price? That was that was a four million dollar discount. Wow. Uh, Whoa! And, 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 did and they take the, it? The seller did not take that. Okay. Um, and said, you know, I'm just going to wait and see. And I and That's I think look, too much. the, the yeah. good news is. You know, as as we've been leading up to April, everybody was wondering what is April going to look like, and and candidly, I was nervous about April because you don't know how tenants are going to respond, and and if they're going to try to take advantage of some of the opportunities out there, knowing that that I can't be evicted. And I know certain parts of the country are worse than others, but in Texas, I would say the lion's share of of residents and properties. Um, uh, specifically are doing very well and collections are trailing a little uh, month over month, but overall it's been, it's been a good, it's been a good start to April. And I think uh, there's some calmness uh, at least in the market now, because of what we're going through right now, you know, yeah, maybe you can breathe a sigh of relief, but then the next question is, Oh gosh, what about May? Right. About right, June? right. You know? right, so, right. So, but for, for, for short term, um, most of our deals either died um, they pushed pause and, and pushed them down the road or the deals that we were going to launch, people said, Hey, let's wait and see what happens here. And so that's kind of where we're at right now. There's not a whole lot of activity uh, at this exact moment, other than people trying to figure out what to, to make of all that's that. That's why you're able to play tennis and um, take walks with your wife. That's, and that's exactly yeah. right. That's exactly so I, right. Before we go on to Paul, I just have to say that I, I am the asset manager in the trenches for the, the um, grow capitalist portfolio. And I want to give a shout out to Nick, Llewellyn's um, uh, newsletter that's going out because we're always looking for best practices. We are all scrambling out there to get the best information. And I have gotten so much great information from the Marcus and Milichup email that is branded for Nick's group. So I really encourage you to check out multifamilyadvisors.com and sign up for their email list. So many gems in the past every day. I'm like, oh my gosh, that answers the question. 
we just had, we were just facing the situation. So thank you, Nick, yeah, for always I, delivering on the content. It's been, th thank you very helpful. much for yeah. saying that. I, I would, I would, I would tell everybody you're welcome to email me and I'll, I'll, I'll put my uh, email and, in the chat and, and yeah. we also keep a very active Facebook uh, page posting that same stuff and I'll put that right. in there as well. But yeah, thanks a lot. We're really yeah. trying to educate right now because that's, that's really all we can do at this point. Right. Nick, so, here's, here's it, a, a slightly inflammatory question from the audience for you. So Jim O'Connor says the seller will wish he had taken it at a $4 million discount. What is Nick's answer to that? Does Nick believe the seller should have taken it at a $4 million discount? You know what? That's a, that is a great question. And, and, and he, you know, he may be right. I, I think, you know, that deal was not my deal. It's just a good client of mine buying another deal. I, I have a couple of deals right now that are teetering. And, and in some cases we're like, you know, this is a great asset. It's a great location. You've got a great resident profile. Let's, let's stay the course here. And then there's others that, that you're like, you know, gosh, I don't know. You know, I'd, yeah. I'd probably move on from this because this one could get really ugly. Um, so, you know, the, the question I'm asking on hundred percent of calls right now is, you know, how are collections month over month? And most properties are inside of 10% month over mm -hmm. month, but, mm -hmm. but there's some that are, you know, 25, 30% lower heard month of over not, month. Not for us, but I've heard the, of that too. Th those are the ones that, you know, if, if, if they're on the brink of being sold, those are ones I'd think long and hard. I mean, it's going to take a while yeah. to recover from that. Um, yeah. so, right. I, so I, I let don't me, know. Let me I, redirect I, that question. Crazy. Can I, can I redirect that sure. question to Paul? Paul, yeah. as a lender, do you think that there's any reason why, you know, on a $20 million product or $22 million product, someone should take $4 million less unless, especially if they're not seeing that, that you know, very high vacancy in April, does the market at this point, uh, is this the kind of market where you take a $4 million haircut or do you just, you know, just simply walk away? I guess it depends because when did you buy the property? How yeah, much equity exactly. is in, into the deal? Uh, have you executed your plan? I mean, Nick, Nick has, brings a good point is that um, maybe is, um, is there um, their blood in the street right now? Uh, is this going to be the first person to exit? Is it, is this going to be, you know, the first of many people to start to sell? You know, we don't absolutely know what's, what's going on, but you know, I don't think, the blood in the streets uh, is going to happen for the next probably another six months. I would say, I think we have to go through a couple of these, these uh, you know, April 1st to the 7th to kind of figure out where collections are May 1st to the 7th, figure out collections and really figure out what June to 1st to the 7th is going to look like. And then kind of figure it out from there. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. I, I, so I, I think that by May 10th, we might have a better feel for this, right? So April, is it fair to say, and I'm, I'm, this question is open to everybody, is it fair to say that so far April's been a little bit of a pleasant surprise in terms of collections? Extremely I'd, pleasant I'd surprise. I'd say so. I'd say so, but... Yeah, yeah. We, we thought that April was going to be a fairly solid month just mm -hmm. because people had jobs and they're committed to, to paying their rents and their in, in, in most of the towns, I mean, New York and some of the stuff on the East Coast, I mean, that's, uh, that, that's kind of an exception, but areas of, of that the virus it really hasn't been caught on, uh, those are still going to be solid, solid returns uh, on uh, net rental income. Um, you know, but we're, we're, we're more concerned about May and June. And then Fritz, maybe you have some comments on that. Yeah, Fritz, uh, we, you, you're muted. There we go. There we go. Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with both Nick and Paul. I mean, I think across the board, everyone that I've talked to, collections seem um, pretty good for April, and I'm, I'm sure we'll get to the forbearance questions. But uh, we later will. on, we haven't, uh, I mean, frankly, you know, with the forbearance agreement, you really have to show that uh, the COVID-19 uh, issues have really affected your property. So we just haven't seen many requests yet. Now, we'll see what happens in May and June. I, I do agree with what Paul said. And, terms of we were we were pretty hopeful that April would be okay um, but I think May and June are going to be the biggest uh, biggest barometers for how bad this is going to really get so, well, so I, I let me add something to that because I I, um, I actually was more concerned about April candidly really? not because not because people couldn't pay uh, I was concerned that they would opt not to because yeah. hey you can't evict me for 120 days so what, what, what are you gonna do you know and and, and that 
I know again, and I can see some of the comments here, different parts of the country, it's, it, they're not experiencing the same thing that we're experiencing. I know collections are rougher in, in certain parts of the country, but New York um, is horrible. Just yeah. absolutely atrocious. I, and, I, yeah. and I have, I have, I have heard that. Um, and you know, some, some in areas of California I know have been, have been uh, a challenge as well. Uh, and, and, and various other places, but I, I will say this, my, you know, and I know Texas and I know some other s uh, states have the same thing, but with unemployment right now, with the additional money that people are getting, there's a lot of people that are going to actually make more money being unemployed, as crazy as that is, um, for, for the next four months, and they're going to get stimulus money. So I'm pretty optimistic for May, you know, I mean, again, who knows? I mean, we're, 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 we're looking at it every day, hoping that it's going to be the case, but, uh, given that people have conditioned themselves to pay and have done that so far in April, I, I feel like they're going to have more money in, in April than, than they have right, right now. And, and so I'm, I'm optimistic for May, uh, but, but we'll see. So, so Paul, I want to, I want to give that question to you. Why is May harder given that, you know, tens of millions of people are going to get ACH checks from the treasury and those checks are supposed to come in in the next 10 days. So obviously that was not money that people had in the first seven days of this month, right? So when that money comes in, it's, you know, $1,200 a person, $2,400 for two people, $3,400 if you have two kids, wouldn't a portion of that, let's say a third or a fourth go towards rents in May? Well, you would think so, but uh, you know, that, that's, that's uh, when, Wind, a windfall of money, recently found money, and I don't know if that's all going to go into paying the rent. You, you would hope so as landlords that that would be the first thing that you would pay. But I would tell you that uh, it may go to Best Buy for a pair of head, headphones, or you're going to find maybe the tenant is going to wind up on, on, your, on his cousin's couch to sleep. So I think there's a moral, moral thing that, that I think Nick pointed out to back in April. They could pay, but would they pay? So... You know, we're going to talk about some factual things, but I thought I'd, you know, I've been in lending for a long period of time, longer than a lot of, a lot of folks have been in, uh, in investing in apartments. And a lot of people just don't understand some of the history of some of these shocks to the economy. And in the 1980s, we had huge inflation. If you can remember the low, low prices of oil and interest rates were on home loans. Ann and I were talking about it. We're 15, 16%. Prime rate was at 21%. And then we had the savings loan bailout. In the 2000 or the 1990s, then we had the first Gulf War. Oil prices were higher. Unemployment was at 7.8, kind of similar to where we're going to be at right now. And then in the 2000s, if you remember, at the beginning of the new decade, we had the dot-com bust, yeah. and then yeah. investors turned to real estate. And yes, the investment bankers created those subprime loans, and then they ran it up to residential commercial real estate market with the largest expansion and commercial and residential values, and then that became a bust. And by mid-2010, we started to recover with the bank bailout. So in 2020, now we've been hit with the overnight collapse of, of the markets, especially uh, the commercial real estate market. So this is a healthcare crisis and not a banking or a financial services crisis, at least until now. So I'm going to believe that the, this thunder, thunderstorm that we're all going through right now is going to last for some time, but as they say, you know, this too shall pass. Yeah. So the immediate results uh, are not going to be really figured out for next couple of months about, is it the time to buy or is it the time to sell? So, uh, uh, you know, I think that, uh, you know, right now of what we're seeing in, in business is that we've closed a lot of the transactions that were on our books to close. Mm -hmm. And we are just really, telling people that uh, unless there's a reason why the seller is selling, <clears throat> like they want to be the first one out the door. Right. And, and I think we're starting to see maybe a little bit every once in a while, if the property wasn't rehabbed or there wasn't enough capital left for, you know, a war chest to, to go through this, this thunderstorm, then they're trying to get the hell out of, out of owning this property. Yeah. But so. uh, you know, you know, it's, it's going to be a little bit before we start to see what the, the, the fallout is. I mean, I'm, I'm very optimistic. I mean, I, you know, like we're talking about through some of these, these shocks of the system, we've had downs and we've recovered. We've had downs and we've recovered. We've had downs and we recover. This is going to be another one that's going to be a down and then we're going to recover. The question really is, is you know, where, do, where is it going to look like in terms of rents? 
uh, are we going to still see the the rental appreciation that we've had for the last number of years? And maybe that's a, a good question to well, ask. Let me, actually, Nick. let me let me ask uh, this. So, so as a lender, I mean, this is for for Paul and Fritz. You know, do you think lending standards are going to change after the pandemic? And if they do change, what kind of changes do you expect to see, and for how long? Fritz, why don't you take that? Yeah, I mean, I think you've already seen massive changes in the lending environment, just with additional, I'm just on the Fannie and Freddie side, you know, pulling back. Fritz, can you, can you yeah, talk run people uh, through that? Just, just give them a rundown of the changes that have already happened, because there's people on here that may not have heard about these. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I just think overall credit in general, um, they're pulling back on leverage, just mm -hmm. in general, and you know, the days of 80 you know, 75 plus 80% 80, 80, uh, LTVs with multiple years of IO. I mean, that, those days are, are somewhat gone in today's environment. So I just think there's just a pullback in credit. I mean, most other, a lot of the other lending sources have pulled back even more significantly than, than the agencies have. But on top of that, they're, they're requiring a bunch of escrows that are, are, are new that they hadn't done in the past. For example, you know, on a deal over $6 million or $6 million loan, they're requiring 12 months of principal and interest, a full year's worth of real estate taxes, a full year's worth of insurance, and a full year's worth of replacement reserves in a separate account that's basically yeah. locked up for at least 12 months um, that the lender is going to hold in escrow. So that, that alone is a significant increase um, in challenge and pullback from the agencies. And, and, uh, and they, frankly, the agencies have done that even when deals were in the middle of uh, closing which has been surprising. Usually once you have a deal quoted, they won't retrade you, but they are so concerned um, of what the next three months um, and how that how it will affect the market that they pulled back significantly. And just to go back to 2007, 2008, I mean, the, even the agencies never did that back then. I think back then it was a little bit slower of a yeah. pullback and with how quickly this has happened, they just feel like they've just significantly just thrown on the brakes to see how the next three months go. Now, if, if it ends up not being as bad as people are projecting, you know, I can see over the summer and the fall and seeing them pull back or uh, be, be a little bit more aggressive on lending standards, but in, they're going to wait and see with how collections go the next three or four months. So what about the, the low interest rates? I mean, is some of, isn't some of that counteracted by these ultra low interest rates that we're hearing about? So yeah, you got to put some money aside, but aren't we getting like, no, aren't we getting in loans for no interest now, like 0 0.25? Like what's mm -hmm. the rates, man? So rates, they'd come back down. I mean, uh, for a while, they, they, they gapped out with uh, the, when it's probably like two weeks ago, they were up to like four and a half, five percent 5%. And then the Fed came in and started buying securities, uh, mortgage-backed securities, which helped stabilize that market. But we're seeing rates, you know, you know mid threes uh, for a you know, like 75% LTV deal. Say so mid threes to fours, depending on loan size. So it's still attractive, but it, I mean, maybe but not, side, not attractive but, enough to overcome the escrows. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And, and Fritz, we've heard CMBS has just disappeared. I mean, for the moment, yeah. they're, you know, <laughs> yeah. the doors are shut. Is that, is that true? Yeah. Most, the, most, a lot of lenders that I've talked to have pulled back significantly on the CMBS side, won't even quote deals. Um, even on the life insurance company side, on some of the lower leverage stuff, they're just not quoting anything right now and can I kind of wait and see. So, I mean, this is why Fannie and Freddie and HUD are, are in business. They're here to uh, provide liquidity in all markets. Now, they're not as aggressive as they were, you know, six months ago, but at least they're out in the market still providing liquidity for borrowers that need it. Well, I know that, that, that uh, we're, we're holding off Nick and Paul, but I just have one more question, which like Paul might chip in on and related to lending because there's a lot of questions about it. What about bridge loans? Like what's happening for, for people that have bridge loans? Should we be scared? And for people, and you know, assuming you're running your property well and, and, and you're in a decent position, should we be scared if we have a bridge loan and how should we, go forward should we only do bridge loans or only do fannie freddie only do agency debt if we were able to get something in contract paul you want to take that one yeah bridge bridge loans um are good if you're looking for uh, to put financing on an acquisition where the property may not qualify based on the the net operating income mm -hmm. and you need to be able to acquire the property rehab the property Stabilize the property and then eventually either sell it or refinance it to uh, you know a non-recourse maybe Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac loan or sell the property something something like that. So it, it gives you the ability to get into these these transactions. So there's bank bridge loans with that which you have you're going to be helped to buy the property, but the bank bridge loans are typically going to be recourse transactions. So they're going to take a look at not only the collateral but they also want to make sure that you have the net worth liquidity to back the deal up because 
if the, if the property is not, if we're going to extend out a higher leverage loan in the deal, then we're going to have to have additional collateral. And that's going to be your personal financial statement. Mm. Now, some of the, the, the non-recourse uh, bridge loans are going to be uh, going to be tougher to find these days yeah. because there's only a couple of non-recourse bridge lenders out there that are actually doing it. We had a transaction that um, we had a, a seller get uh, was selling a property about seventy million dollars, in just like the transaction that uh, Nick was talking about, uh, two days before closing, the lender got hit uh, with a declining stock price, and so all of a sudden they stopped lending, and uh, that was a large non-recourse bridge loan, and so I would be apprehensive right now about trying to get in at least the next month or so to get into a, a, a bridge loan, I would just say, other part of the equation is um, the bridge loans right now, uh, if it's a bank bridge loan, if you currently have a property, you've, you, you, know, you closed on the transaction, you've been operating it for a year or two, and then you're having problems with cash flow on the transaction, uh, I would say your, your banker is gonna be a lot more flexible than say Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and we'll talk a little bit about that forbearance agreements that out there but the yeah. bankers right now are that uh, if it's a if it's a recourse loan, they're more likely to work with you mm -hmm. than than if it was just um, a non recourse bank loan. Um, uh, so I would be a little right now. I'd be apprehensive. I mean, to tell you the truth, we're not recommending to be honest with you to get into any transaction unless there's a superior reason that the seller is selling, and then you can see value in the property to buy. Makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. Follow up question, Paul, for those of us that, that have purchased a property a year ago or a year and a half ago using a bridge loan and we're now coming up to an extension. Yes. If the property is performing well, do you expect the lender to, uh, you know, just allow the extension to go through as long as there's performance or they, will yeah. they come back and make it more onerous? They could, they could, it could go either way. They could, they could take you and say, listen, it was a non-recourse and now because we're not hitting our metrics of the deal that you promised us that you were able to do it. Now we may want to pick up maybe a little bit of recourse in the mm -hmm. deal, but more than not, uh, lenders are renters of money. They are not owners of real estate. They do not really want your property. They don't want to put the property in foreclosure. They don't want to own it. They, they just want to rent you the money. So they're going to try to work with you the best they can to make sure that you can continue on and, and make your payments. So 100% say, uh, if you own a property right now, stay in front of your banker. Stay. Good advice. Don't, yeah. uh, don't try to, to disappear. Uh, tell them exactly what's going on. I mean, your banker is your biggest partner. They're the ones that gave you all this money, 75%, 80% of the purchase price originally. They, they trust you. They are giving you the credit uh, and the flexibility of these transactions, but they don't, you don't want them to come look for you. You want to be in front of them all the time. And I would tell you like a good, a lot of good operators push out, if you're pushing out to your limited partner's information about what's going on in the deal, push out information directly to your servicer, to your banker on a once a week basis about what's going on with collections. That's a great, great advice. So what we're seeing is that the, the ones that are more, you know, talkative, more in front of their bankers okay. are the ones that know what's going on because the bankers really want to kind of figure out in their portfolio, what has a green light on it, what has a yellow light on it, or what has a red light on it. And they won't know that until they understand what your collections are. So I'd say for the first eight weeks, the next eight weeks, copy your servicer, your lender, your banker, whoever it is, copy them in to the, into your transaction about what's going on. You will, you will live uh, with, with, with a better, a better banker in the future because they will trust you that they, you know what the hell is, is going on. That's a huge nugget, Paul. I wrote that down because we, we really hadn't thought about that, Anna, yeah. right? I mean, we, we were talking about community investor with investors yeah, and with tenants, a lot of. but we haven't really done much with telling our bankers where we stand. So, so yeah. well, well, this, is, this is action item number one for me. Yeah, from we this, reached from out here. to them to find out where they stand. But right. We haven't communicated actively to them to tell them week by week where we stand. When well, you're talking really, to Fritz, really I mean, Fritz is, a, Fritz is a, a Fannie Mae lender. 
So right. again, there's only 25 Fannie Mae lenders. Fred, so how do you want to be treated? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, but Paul, you, I mean, everyone, Paul, you've been 100% right. More communication, the better, um, especially as, as, as a situation that is as fluid as, as it is right now. The more communication that we understand your situation. And if you end up being in a position where you're going to need some help, it's better, uh, better for you to be constantly in communication with us so we know where, where you're at than throwing on us and say, okay, hey, we got serious problems and we got to move, you know, and by the next couple of days before your May payment. The better, the more you can communicate over the next few months. Um, if, if you have a problem, it's going to be easy for, easier for us to deal with it. All right, let's, let's throw some stuff Nick's way. Poor Nick, he's sitting up there. <laughs> so uh, do you think multifamily and commercial prices will drop? And if so, how long will it be before we start seeing great deals? Well, yeah, I mean, certainly that's the, you know, for, for the last, well, I would say three or four years, I've heard a lot of, hey, I'm waiting for the next uh, correction in the market and I've got all this dry powder and the market's too frothy now and, and all that. Well, now we obviously have uh, uh, something that, that certainly looks like it could be um, a significant uh influence on pricing. Come on, Nick. Uh, Stick your neck out. Tell, yeah. tell us what you think. I mean, I, I, how, I how think, much? How much? I, I, don't, I don't know yet. I mean, I think it's, it, it's going to be, you know, the, the two questions that, that I think will have a big impact on that are, are A, when do we turn the world back on again, right? And right, so if, yeah. right. If that's 30 days from now, that's, that's going to look a lot different than if that's 90 days from now. Yeah. Um, that's, 90 that's days is, uh, feels more time. like Armageddon. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, exactly. I mean, uh, and then the second one is, you know, obviously unemployment is, is sky high. In fact, it's double what it was right now uh, compared to the last recession. Yeah. Um, so, so that's, that's pretty terrifying. However, you know, how many of these people immediately get rehired when the world gets turned back on again, right? So, so I think, uh, you know, some of the things, I mean, obviously there's, there's behavior patterns that, that um, are going to change forever or at least for a long time after this, but I, I think there's just so many unknowns in terms of how, how active are people going to be? Are people going to go back out to restaurants or, or you know, so uh, are, are people going to go to movies? Are people going to go to retail places? Uh, I, I don't know. And, and so I think there's a major trickle down into the apartment world and into the job world and, and, and that has such an impact on finances and all that. At the end of the day, 30 days ago, the fundamentals in Dallas, Fort Worth and Texas and, and, and a lot of the country were outstanding and and it's just it's so different all of a sudden 30 days later that it's it's hard to know even what 30 days from now is going to look like uh i I will tell you that there are you know people have said what kind of deals do you foresee being available or trading right now in this market and you know and and one example would be and it's 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 funny because it's the total opposite way that we've done deals in the last 10 years. Mm-hmm. But, but one is, uh, you know, I have a, a client who has an assumption deal and he's, he's, he's frustrated. He's been frustrated before this happened. So now he's really, you know, to the point where, Hey, I don't know if I want to keep owning this deal. I might just be right. ready to move on and, and let seller it be financing. somebody else's deal, not yeah. seller financing, but if somebody were to assume that loan and maybe okay, throw, it. yeah, throw maybe Five fifty. It's a three point one million dollar balance. So you know, mm-hmm. through five fifty six hundred k on top of that, you're buying the deal for less than what you normally would buy a deal for, and the principal reduction alone is about fifty five thousand a year. So you cash flow zero dollars. You still made ten percent on your money just because of the terms of of this uh, you know this particular transaction, and you cash flow five percent. Well, all of a sudden your total return is is fifteen percent. So you know, it's not a great deal for somebody who's like, I got to have cash flow right now. But for somebody who's saying, Hey, I don't need the cash flow. I want a good investment over the next four or five years um, that I can maybe double my money on, you know, that that's the kind of deal that I think you, you might see some of right now, people that have existing Fannie or Freddie debt that, that are ready to move on that are willing to potentially sell for a loss. And, uh, you know, so I, I, I think those are some of the, the unique types of deals that, that I did in the last recession that I've, I've seen a, a couple of here in the last uh, couple of weeks. So, hmm. so we'll see. Uh, but I don't, I don't, I wouldn't forecast a, just a massive reduction in prices at this point. Um, you know, but, but maybe I'll have a different answer for you 30 days or 45 days from now. Well, just as a follow on to that, cause we're talking about timing, 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 and you've got a clock behind you. What about people that are in the middle of a 1031? 
Yeah. Do you foresee any relief for them? Yeah. What do yeah. you recommend for those people that are that are going yeah. in a 1031? Yeah, it's interesting. I mentioned two of my deals, uh, or I mentioned that I had a lot of deals that were, were falling out and, and that had died or had been pushed. I do have two deals in escrow right now that, that are both uh, 1031 buyers mm -hmm. um, and, and they have fairly significant tax consequences and, and all things being equal would, would prefer to close than, right. than not close, um, you know, despite some of the volatility. And so um, I was on a, a call earlier today and, and somebody with NMHC uh, was on that call and, and specifically said that, hey, we're very aware of the 1031 issue we're working very closely with Capitol Hill on, you know, trying to a provide some clarity because so far there really hasn't been anything said about it, and uh, and b you know get 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 some relief for people and at least give them a little bit more time. So if I had to guess, I would certainly say they're going to give some people more time. I don't see how anybody can can you know move operate in this with, environment. You, you right. can't even do due diligence right now. So how how are you right. going to put something under contract and? And I'm going to bet 50 bucks they do it. I mean, because <laughs> yeah. the, the truth is, it is humong it's going to be devastating to the marketplace. It's going to make recovery for real estate much harder. I think they're going to throw us a bone, and I think it's probably going to be another 45 days or maybe another 90 days. I, so I, I, I think that's going to happen. Yeah, I do too. I do too. And I think it's going to happen quickly. I think we'll hear something in the next you know, week to 10 mm -hmm. days, because I, I think there's there's people with the clock's ticking right now and they're getting a lot of pressure of, of hey, what's going to happen here? Just tell us one way or another so I can move on, but, but don't just not, you know, take a stance on it. So I, I think it's going to happen very, very soon. Um, Paul, we've heard, had a lot of people in our previous town halls asking us questions about HELOCs and, you know, should they be thinking of using HELOCs and unsecured lines of credit as reserves during this, this crisis? or even to, you know, use to snap up deals. What, what are your thoughts on using HELOC at this point? Uh, ELOCs, like uh, H-E-L-O-C, ELOCs, Home Equity Lines of Credit on residential real estate? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They uh, want to pull HELOCs before they're gone, and they want that, that as their dry powder. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I don't, a a yeah I, I don't have a problem with that. I mean, that was the first thing, if you go back 10 10 years ago, it was the first thing that a lot of the banks did is they, they stopped offering uh, ELOCs across the board. So if you can put one in place and it doesn't cost you a lot of money, I don't have a, I don't have a problem with, with that. Yep. Uh, but, but ELOCs are not, I mean, you, could put, you cannot put second liens against your apartments or you usually your, your commercial real estate, typically, if it's a, if it's a securitized loan, maybe if it's, it was a, a, a bank loan, maybe you could have them put a second lien against the property, but but typically you're not going to put uh, additional liens uh, underneath the, the senior lien in the deal. Right. Okay, well, what what's the best for those that are thinking of refinancing because it's a great opportunity for them or they're forcing an opportunity, what's the best tool to check refinancing rates? It's, it's changing all the time, right? Is there a method or tool you can use to track those rates and know when to pull that trigger? You're going to have to have a relationship with your lender to kind of figure that out. And you got to figure out if it's worth it to re refinance. There are some, there's a lot of properties with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and some of the, C the CMBS lenders that you really cannot uh, economically do it because a lot of these loans in difference to your residential loan are going to have these substantial prepayment penalties on right. them. And so it, it doesn't, it's not going to make economic sense because every time that interest rates goes down and you're thinking, I'm just going to go from my 5% down to three and a half percent fixed rate that, that uh, uh, Fritz was talking about. If it's a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac loan, that, that could be exponentially large of a prepayment penalty. If it was a $3 million deal. It may be a million dollars to pay that loan off. And so that may not make sense. But if you have a bank loan that maybe is at four or 5%, uh, and you have good cash flow on that property and you want to go from a recourse loan to a, a non-recourse loan and try to capture that low rate, maybe that's something to think about to refinance uh, these deals. Fritz, any additional feedback on that? No, I just think it's been such a volatile rate environment over the last um you know, three or four weeks. I mean, and a lot of times it's easier, you know, in, in an efficient market, you can kind of try to track the 10 year treasury and say, okay, that'll kind of be a good barometer of where rates are. Uh, you just take a spread over that and, and you can kind of run with it as a guesstimate. But in today's environment, um, 
the end of the mortgage backed security market in general is so volatile that, you know, things are changing on a daily basis. So I just think, again, just like reaching out to your lender or your mortgage broker on kind of the status of what your property is up to, I, mean, I would reach out and get feedback on rates as well, because even from a Monday to a Wednesday, it can be drastically different. I mean, we then, had, just, just for yeah. a good example, a couple of weeks ago, yeah. just over the weekend, rates that went from, you know, probably three, three and a half, three weeks ago, over the weekend went to five. Um, wow. And, and, and the 10 year treasury didn't even move. It's just the mechanics of, of how these loans are securitized. There were serious problems. So things are just moving so, so drastically. So just communication is key. The other part that I was going to say is that if you get into a transaction right now is you can't rate lock the loan up front as you were in the past. Yeah. We could do an early rate lock. And so today you have to wait, you get an executed loan application. The loan gets approved and committed. All the third parties are, do are done. And about 35 or 45 days later, then we're able to lock that rate. And so the rate that was quoted on the front is may not look like the rate that you're going to get. So we, that's the volatility. The other thing is, is that we have the 10-year treasury, which was at maybe one and three quarters or so just six months ago, is down to 0 0.65, 0 0.7 or so. And so we don't even use that, the 10-year treasury anymore. We kind of use an artificial floor, and that's how we're calculating our, our rates these days. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about another thing that's moving the markets that, Nick, uh, people are asking, you might know a thing about, and well, you have, several of you are from Texas. Let's talk about oil. How is oil impacting the, uh, the Texas market and pricing? Is it having any impact on real estate or, um, money or anything? Yeah, you know, it's, uh, we, we actually do uh, quite a bit uh, in West Texas and Eastern New Mexico, actually. Um, and yeah, we, we've had a lot of success out there. It's so far, and it's funny, we've reached out to our clients out there. So far, it's been okay, um, but it's not sustainable as it is right now. So yeah, it, it certainly is going to Houston also. Has, has, we don't do as much in Houston, but uh, Houston is also um, you know being hit really hard by that right now. We have some good clients that, that own down there. So yeah, it's, it's, it's going to make a big difference if, if we don't start seeing some changes soon. One thing that is a little different this time around versus the last uh, downturn is that um, they can make money uh, at a cheaper barrel cost now than they could previously. So um, I think that's a great point. I mean, they've, they've, they've made, shale has become so much more efficient. Yeah. Used to be, you know, break even was 55, then it was 45. And now it's, you know, in the 30s or the low 30s, yes. for, especially for the Permian Basin that they can afford to keep pumping this stuff out at cost for a while and pay their expenses. So that's, that's a good point. Their cost basis has gone down. That's exactly right. And so, uh, you know, the, the, so far, you know, maybe the, the, some, of the, some of these properties had monster waiting lists and, and were basically full all the time. You know, maybe, maybe that's dwindled a little bit, but, you know, our clients have told us, hey, so far we, we don't see a bunch of people moving away. We're not having trouble collecting rents. Most of these people are still employed, you know, but, but obviously, you know, it's, uh, it, it could change rapidly out there. And that is very heavily their economy in a lot of these places. So yeah, it's a, it's a concern. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk a little bit more about forbearance and, and what happens, you know, if you do find yourself in a, in a position where you're, you're, you know, say you're a syndication, you got an apartment building and you, you have a syndication and you think you might need to apply for forbearance. How does that work? What does the program look like? And does it affect your, your ability to buy more in the future? Like what's the ding? Yeah, so I guess just to start off, I'll answer yourself. Paul, you're, you're, more, you're muted. Yeah, I was just going to have Fritz talk about that, and then I'll make some comments on the backside. Okay. Yeah, I mean, just to start off quickly, Fannie and Freddie both have come out and said, you know, even if you go into forbearance, it's not going to be a you know red red mark against you doing loans in the future. Now, if you break your forbearance agreement and don't live up to your end of the forbearance, then yes, you know, you're going to have issues getting Fannie Mae loans in the future. But I think there's just been a lot of um, back and forth in the forbearance space, whether that's in in the media. Um, and what they're spitting up, FHFA, who regulates Fannie and Freddie. So I think both Fannie and Freddie initially came out with programs, and then ultimately the CARES Act was passed, and then they both kind of reworked it. Um, and so they finally have a, an actual forbearance plan. I think the biggest thing that I would tell folks on the call is a forbearance is really for deals that are struggling because of the COVID-19 problem. So if you, if you are really struggling before 
Um, just because COVID happened doesn't necessarily mean that, that you'll be granted forbearance. But really, it's going to be focused on deals that are below 1-0 debt service coverage um, that you can prove, I would say, starting in April, um, that you've had serious collection problems. And I think one of the biggest changes, at least on the Fannie Mae side, that they've made with the new program that came out about last week was before they had a... Rich, your audios. Fritz, your audio is going. We lost audio for you, Fritz. Fritz. Oh, we lost, lost Fritz. We Paul, lost Fritz. Paul, Paul, we'll, ask, wanted... uh, well, we'll ask you to pick up from there. So I think what he was going to say was, is that last week, Fannie Mae kind of changed the rules on what they were allow. What they were going to do is, is 90 days plus, uh, and then they would, uh, for uh, evictions, and then they were going to give you 12 months to repay if you got into a forbearance agreement. And then they, they kind of have changed it just recently. And uh, they're going to give you 120 days through this CARES Act. And then after the, after the 120 days that you're able to, even if you're in a forbearance agreement, you're able to start to evict people after, with, with cause mm -hmm. uh, after the 120 days. But uh, one of the things that I, I really want to talk about, and I'll bring Fritz on here just a second, but there's, there's two items that I think are important. And I, again, I take a historical perspective on this. But historically, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac did not like or do not like the syndication model. And let me repeat that just one more time, is that the agencies do not like, uh, Fannie and Freddie do not like unaffiliated limited partners or limited partners, which is the equity, that, that really don't know each other. So let me give you a short history lesson on lending. If you were lending 15 or 25 years ago, there weren't a lot of large syndications like they are today. It was like two or three rich guys buying a property together. The bank understood the signing partners, what their net worth was, what their liquidity, their ownership and management experience with the partners. Uh, they were bringing all the equity themselves and they were all going to sign on the deal. And that they, if there was a risk, that all of them would handle it. So, so the banks liked that everyone was signing on the loan and they, had all, they were all affiliated together, whether they were friends or family. And they all had a vested interest to make sure the deal worked. If there ever was a problem, each equity partner would dig into their prop pocket and, and, and feed the deal. So about 12 years ago, uh, and again, this, that was just a blink of an eye, we wanted to see if uh, the agents, we, in agencies would start looking at these unaffiliated limited partners in the syndication model. So again, unaffiliated partners would raise the equity from private placement memorandums, and you would have a general partner in a KP or two that would have the net worth and liquidity and hopefully their experience in managing the apartment building. And then the rest of the money was gonna be brought by the limited partners. So Fannie Mae did not like that at all, but after a few years and lots of discussions, they said, okay, and it was a, it was a timid okay, but there was one big caveat. They said, if, you, if the property ever needs a cash injection in the future, like this black swan event, you must turn towards your limited partners to keep the property going. So today, We've gotten away from the 10 or 15 limited partners as it was, you know, 10 years ago. Now we have 100 partners. So I'm here to remind you that if you're a limited partner and your partnership rings the bell, it needs additional cash to keep going, you're going to have to put some additional equity into the transaction. So perhaps, God forbid, on a $100,000 investment, you may need to throw in five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 to keep the partnership going. If we don't, then I would see the syndication model at risk perhaps larger spreads, more reserves, lower leverage. Those could be the possible levers for Fannie and Freddie to use. Very true. Very true. I, and, I, and I honestly can't blame the lenders for that, right? Because yeah. the, the, the likelihood that those LPs will actually put money up, will true up, is not very high. So it's certainly possible that the syndication world could get a black mark if we don't manage our properties well in the next three to six months. The other part is, and I'll just finish this up and you go on to the next question, is really there's, a, there's some panic in the streets. We've talked a little bit about it. But remember that if you did a non-recourse loan, like with Fannie and Freddie or CMBS, that if your limited partners don't have the capacity to put money into the deal, and then you start talking about, I just need more time, I need more time, but the, the property may go into foreclosure. And you say, I'm, hey, listen, I'm going to put this deal in the bankruptcy and that may be give me seven to eight months before I go see a bankruptcy uh, attorney or go to a bankruptcy judge. Uh, you file 
uh, for bankruptcy, your entity files for bankruptcy, and you're starting, you're trying to stand in the way of that train coming down the tracks, that loan may go from non-recourse to recourse. Because in those documents that you sign, it says that you wouldn't stand in the way if Fannie Mae wanted to get that property back. So, so just use that uh, in your big picture things that the KPs, the, the key principles that sign on behalf of the partnership, that uh, they would become liable for, the, for a deficiency balance if it ever came. And Paul, its, also, isn't it true that if you filed bankruptcy, you probably wouldn't get a Fannie loan again anyway? You'd probably be out. So Fritz, any other feedback on that? Yeah, if you do give a deal back, um, I would pretty much guarantee that you wouldn't um, be able to do an, a, at least a Fannie loan in the future. I mean, I know folks that have, you know, gave a Fannie loan back 25 years ago and that are big, strong borrowers that, you know, Fannie still won't change their mind um, even, even 20, 25 years later. Um, but, but overall, sorry, my phone cut out there, but ultimately to go back to the forbearance, it's just, it's really there for, to, for deals that really need it. Um, mm -hmm. So go below debt service coverage, you know, work with your servicer and uh, you know, they should be willing to work with you as long as you can prove to them that, Hey, you know, we went from, we were at 90, 95 collections for the last six months. All of a sudden we collected, you know, half of our rent for a month or two. And we can't support this. You know, th that's what the forbearance program is really for. Makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. And uh, can I take a few minutes to talk about uh, University Oaks? Is that is this the right time? Okay. All right. You're you're muted, by the way. Um, yes. So that's um, a great time. Um, so, you know, given where we are in the environment, honestly, I'm not looking at value add deals right now. I don't want to look at them for 45 days. I, I think 45 days is a good amount of time to kind of figure out where we we stand. Um, and as so many of you on the, on the call know, we do you know, new construction projects as well. And we've done some blockbuster ones. We've done some that are over 100 million. We've done others that are over 50 million. And this is also not a good time to look at blockbuster con new construction projects for pretty much the same reasons. Nobody really knows what sort of loans you're going to get. And so even before this black swan event hit, we were basically retooling because we started feeling that the value add market was beginning to lose its value add, uh, if you know what I mean. And so we were beginning to retool for projects that were smaller, more nimble. If there were new construction, we could get the construction done like in half or a third of the time that it would take for one of our blockbuster deals. Um, and we would get financing both from single family type lenders as well as um, multifamily lenders. And so what was interesting is we were working on this for a while and then this black swan event hits and now we have projects that we're looking at that look like this. So just a, a two minute look at one of our upcoming projects. Here it comes on the screen. So what we've done with these projects is, and let me know if my screens, uh, and I, you guys can see my screen. Anna? Oh, oh, sorry, you're, you're muted, but I think I heard you say yes. All right. So what we're doing is we are shrinking the size of our projects because we feel that today with the risk that is inherent in the marketplace, it makes sense to do smaller projects that are much quicker to cash flow. So unlike our larger construction projects, this University Oaks is a smaller project. It's basically quadplexes or a collection of quadplexes, which lenders look at differently because you can sell them to individual buyers. So you can sell them to a 1031 buyer. You can sell them to an opportunity zone buyer. And also quadplexes can be built in less than half the time that it takes us to build a 250 unit building. So what we're doing is we're doing wellness projects. And these are, these are branded wellness projects where the air is purified, the water is purified, you know, you're using circadian lighting, you're giving away e-bikes, and you're reducing the density, which is becoming a big deal. And we're placing them right next to major parks. Because today, after Corona, parkland is like beachland, yeah. right? So it's like beachfront property. People want to be close to parks because they don't really know if they're going to be go, able to go, go out to gyms. So we're, what we've done is we've cut out the traditional sort of amenities. There's no gym, there's no pool, there's no roof deck. No elevators. And what we've created are these, no elevators. What we're doing is we're building properties that are designed for speed and are, we have so many different exits. So we can sell a quadplex to an, uh, one of our investors. So it's a syndication that where you can actually buy the quadplexes from us as, as we finish in a year. This is, the, this is our pivot. We're looking at this going, 
Well, one of the biggest benefits is that we don't have to have tenants in here for a year. And this thing, as all of us have said, is going to sort out in a year. So in a year, we'll have a better feel for where we stand. And so now we're building collections of quadplexes and small projects. Now, these are so small that we can actually finance them entirely through equity if we need to. We don't need to put in debt. And so we've got the options of no debt. We've got the options of, you know, basically, and, and our favorite option is we're going to do these eight quadplexes at a time and sell three of them at CFO and basically get our money back and then hold them debt free. Because I think that being debt free in this environment is the best thing in the universe, right? So we're, we're trying to basically change things and change to a, a construction model that has very little debt or we have lots and lots of exit options. And here's the most beautiful thing. We are not seeing any impact on lending for this kind of activity. Actually, lenders are very hungry because obviously they're not lending on their larger projects, the 200 units or 300 units. Not to say that we don't want to do blockbuster multifamily projects. I just don't think that timing is right for them today. Um, not to say we don't want to do value adds. We love them. We want to go back to them, but we want to wait for some more blood to be in the water. We just don't think there's enough blood in the water today. We think that that's going to happen in Q3. So in the meantime, we're doing projects like this. So these are, what's lovely about these projects is such an astonishing array of renters. We're building them at a much lower cost because they're so quick to build. And we're out of our loan in, in a year or less, possibly even in 11 months. So these are the, this is kind of an example of the sort of pivot that you have to have in a market like this. So uh, University Oaks is the first of five or six projects that we're going to do like this. And what's beautiful is all of a sudden your lender starts to cough up. You don't build all of them. So we're building them in clusters of 16. And if our lender backs off, we'll only build 16 instead of 32 or 48. But your project is fully viable and starts to make money immediately. Is it, you know, so, so you've got the ability to continue your construction through bad times. And what's nice is we're building them only in markets that have where construction is an essential activity. So we can actually build them through lockdowns. Currently, our construction projects are moving forward. In fact, one of them has sped up because we have more crews available than we did before. So these are some examples of the sort of pivots that the people that are on this, this webinar should be thinking about. So University Oaks is a perfect example of a, of a, of a pivot where we're de-risking. Obviously, these, are, these may be lower returns. Obviously, these may be smaller projects with us making a lot less in fees. But the key is the risk is down and, and you're in the deal for, much, for, for a much smaller amount of time. So I wanted to just share that with you. Back to you, Anna. Risk is everything mm -hmm. right now. You're right. Anna, you're, you're uh, yep. muted. I'm yeah. unmuting myself. Thank you. Um, okay. So we are going to our live questions that are on the Q&A. Mm -hmm. And we've got about 15 minutes left. Mm -hmm. um, so we, some of the questions, of course, are things that have been asked before. But... Um, Let's see. So let's talk about different asset types. Um, what different asset types do you think are, do you would it stay away from as uh, acquisitions and debt side? Let's, let's have Nick hit, if you're you know, thinking outside of the multifamily box, you can include multifamily in it. What assets do you recommend acquiring? And then Paul, what, what assets from a debt side would, and, and Nick, Fritz, would you be interested in and not interested in at all? Yeah. Yeah. Um... Well, obviously, I mean, hotels are rough right now, and it's gonna it's gonna be a long time before uh, before hotels rebound, um, and so that's that's you know that's what what about retail, Nick? Re retail would be the second thing I would say. I mean, I've, I can tell you this: I've barely left my house other than to exercise in the last thirty days, and somehow I have groceries and and everything I need here. So I I, I, I do think habits change. I mean, I've always been an Amazon guy, but but even more so, you're leaning on different uh, uh, ways to uh, to to get goods and and the necessities. And then I think even just going to the movies and going out to eat and and that sort of thing. Those those are those are difficult uh, things. We don't know how that's going to look moving forward. I would say certainly multifamily feels really you know, as good as, as any investment right now. I mean, despite all the volatility and all the, the negative things we've talked about here, I, I still feel very grateful that, that most of my investments are in the multifamily uh, world and, and certainly not as much in the stock market and stuff that we have no control over right now. Industrial seems to, 
um, to also be a good place to be uh, moving mm -hmm. forward. I, I do have some industrial investments as well, and and you know so far that that stuff uh, seems to to be very very solid. And uh, I mean, so maybe a one way to describe multifamily is, is the best looking pig in the pigsty, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> right. So I, I mean, that's really the, the, the place we are in. And, and some of the others that we've heard that have done well. And one of the things that I've done is on Wikipedia, there's a page that shows every real estate investment trust that's publicly traded in the real estate space. So it's one page and there's 57 real estate investment trusts. And, and you know, there's trusts of all kinds. There's everything from data center to multifamily to industrial to self storage. And so what we've done is we've actually gone in and looked at how much each of those have declined compared to the others. And we can tell you the, the best performing are not multifamily. They are, they are self storage, which is done. I mean, those REITs have done phenomenal. There's almost no decline whatsoever. Yeah, and then well. there's, uh, there's data centers. Data centers are actually positive. They, they've actually gone up in the marketplace and you can see why, right? Obviously they, they directly benefit from a lockdown. Um, you know, a lot more, a lot more clients coming in, you know, clients like Zoom spending massive amounts of money, Amazon spending massive amounts of money. So data centers are actually very positive right now. Self storage is doing well. The one other the one that Nick has gotten hit really badly uh, is is um, other than hotels is uh, senior housing. I mean, if if grandma is ninety years old, do you want her to live in a senior housing place with a hundred other aged adults and this enemy kind of wandering the the corridors? So yeah. people have started pulling out their their you know their their aged parents and and moving them back to their homes. So from what we've seen in the in the REIT market. The, the senior housing stuff is getting really slaughtered. And I, I think until a vaccine is developed, it's going to be really tough to make the decision to put grandma back in the, in the you know, assisted living facility. Yeah. Paul, Fritz, you want to offer any opinions here about uh, best asset classes for the new world? Well, Nick hasn't missed a meal. Sorry, so I uh, definitely. Fritz and, yeah, Paul. <laughs> I, I definitely agree with, uh, you know, Fritz's or um, Nick's, uh, thinkings that uh, you know, retail is, is 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 not a good flavor of the month. Hotels not a good flavor. Uh, mobile home parks maybe it's just going to be tougher to find that inventory right now and yep. kind of figure out what the valuation is. I will tell you personally, I closed on a a senior living center on at the end of February, so this whole thing blew itself up. So now I'm I'm a big. A large limited partner in, one, uh, in a large uh, senior living facility. So, but I'd rather have that right now in the portfolio because I got senior people that get checks that are coming in from the government from uh, from their their Medicare and Medicaid right. and, and their Social Security. But that place is on lockdown. It's worse than a prison. You cannot go in or you cannot go out. And so, uh, I, I yeah. you know, if you're going to be quarantine that's the place to be quarantined because nothing's going in or out of there so that makes sense that's a different viewpoint but it definitely makes sense yeah so if you have more uh, senior housing out there <laughs> this becomes distressed uh, you know send me an email let's take a look at I that i think it's a great asset class paul i i just think that there's a lot of fear in the marketplace and that's why their reits are getting hammered um yeah. because because of the bad fact news. that Lots you know mentally yeah, exactly. There's a lot of bad news around senior housing at this point, especially because the outbreak in the U.S. started with a senior housing facility. And I will tell you this, what uh, Fritz will say is new construction uh, uh, with uh, doing HUD deals. Uh, Fritz, can you talk a little bit about that and yeah. some of the deals yeah. you're working on? Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, new construction could be a good way because obviously as we, you know, a lot of like you talked about, you know, being in the ground over the next, you know, nine to 12 months is a pretty good time considering hopefully when you're done with the construction project, um, you know, the economy is in, in better shape. But, you know, HUD has a great uh, new construction program, HUD FHA, where you can get non-recourse financing for, you know, it's a construction to perm loans. You don't need to worry about taking any take at risk or it's 40 year term, 40 year amortization at, you know, three and a half percent interest rates today. Um, it's a little bit of a headache process to get through, call it nine, nine to 12 months to close, but you don't, have, you don't have any, you don't have any no, take. That, that's sugar coating. HUD's never been a little bit of a headache. It's always been a huge headache, but, but I think but today is the flavor better, of the right? month, a, right? Yeah, Everybody it's, wants it's, to talk HUD. Everybody is like, oh my God, let's go HUD. Yeah. You know, Paul and I are, are hopefully going to be closing on a deal here in about a month uh, down in Austin, a uh, HUD deal. And one of the, the questions that, you know, the, our borrower had was, hey, are we concerned that HUD's going to pull back? And, you know, we've been working on this for, for 12 months, ready to close. Are we going to have any problems 
but then pulling the rug on us. And, you know, frankly, HUD takes a lot of pride that they are non, that they're not a cyclical lender. You know, they're going to yeah. have their same program and, and whether it's, you know, the yeah. market's really on or, or it's not. Um, I, I think HUD's a charter-based organization, so they couldn't okay. give, they wouldn't give a damn, right? So what, right. what kind of market you're in? Yeah, and they, and they'll, change, they'll, they'll change, you know, minor things, maybe a little mm -hmm. bit longer interest reserve, but right. not, not, not a drastic change. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Well, let's talk a little bit about the bigger picture. So we've got the, the we're happy as multifamily that, that the government's printing a lot of money that's coming to our tenants and our, you know, business owners that live in our buildings, et cetera. But what does that mean for the larger economy and going forward? Can I get some opinions from the panel? When we're printing trillions of dollars, what happens next? Well, inflation, that's what's coming. So if you own real estate, your, your property is going to be worth a lot more because the dollar is going to be worth a lot less. So uh, Neil, anything more to add to that? Um, so my feedback is it's coming, but it's not coming in the short term. So one of the things that we learned from 2008, which was we changed economics, by the way, Keynesian economics always believed you, you print a lot of money, you get a lot of inflation immediately. And, and honestly, the exact opposite has happened. We've printed, the world has printed an astonishing amount of money in the last 10 years and nowhere in the world, no major economy has seen even 2% inflation. And so the first thing that we've learned in economics in over the last 10 years is that yes, you print money and you create inflation. Clearly that, that is the cause and effect, but you cannot do that until your economy becomes strong. Right. So you, you don't get inflation in a weak economy because it's very, very difficult to drive demand. Inflation needs a lot of demand to feed off of. When demand is falling or demand is stagnant, it's very difficult to get inflation for more than a few weeks or more than a few months. It doesn't rear its head for a significant amount of time. To, to be honest, the, the Federal Reserve at this point is going to be fighting deflation, not inflation, because there's a collapse of demand, right? So they, there is no demand. And so in my mind, the next six to 12 months, let's not worry about inflation. But in the end, you have to pay the piper. You cannot print this astonishingly large amount of money and not get inflation in the long run. I think that at this point, we've guaranteed large scale inflation around the world because it isn't just us. I mean, look at what the Eurozone is doing. Look at what the Japanese are doing. Everyone is just completely ignoring the fact that you can't print forever. For the moment, all of that fiscal prudence has just completely gone out the door. And so we, we will pay for this. But, and then, you know, I, I, I say this, I mean, I want to hold as much real estate when we get to hyperinflation, though, though I'm going to suffer like everybody else, but I'd much rather be holding real estate and suffer than not hold real estate and suffer. Okay, so we have, uh, what is the advice you'd give to smaller investors who aren't syndicating, they don't have millions to, to invest in? We've already established they shouldn't be doing hotels, but what asset type could they take advantage of? Or maybe what loan type? You know, give, maybe from the debt side, let's assume they're doing, they're going some type of residential. What loan type should they be looking at for smaller multifamily? Is anything come up for you, Paul or Nick? Can you suggest any strategies they should use? We've got these smaller investors not going syndication. Nick? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, I mean, right now, I mean, candidly, I would say yeah, I would wait. Uh, okay. I, I, probably not the best time in the world to be jumping into a market that's got literally every variable that that's uncertain, uh, uncertain. You know, but I will also say, as always, all of these uh, challenges create opportunities to learn yes. and to observe yep. and to figure out, um, you know, figure out where opportunities are, and so. Um, you know, I, I would say be patient. Um, if if it's if it's as bad as we we you know some people think it, it's going to be, then th there'll continue to be deals out there. If it's temporary, um, you know, which which it very well may be too, or you know, not super long term, then you know that that's okay. You didn't make some hasty decision that you're going to regret. But I, I would say if I was sitting out there with a, a small amount of money, eager to to be in a deal, I would, I would not recommend this as being the time that you, you uh, decided to, to go all in because it's, it's, um, I, it's too violent. I would, yeah, I would also say this is a great time to build relationships, That's good point, build relationships yeah. with guys like Nick, build relationships with your uh, attorneys, your title companies, the brokers out there, you know, build your education, spend time on understanding how this stuff works. Look at it, good 
general partners. And I consider, and, and I haven't invested in one of Neil's and Anna's deals, but I would consider uh, Neil and Anna to be good operators. I can't tell you how much I enjoy not going into Facebook and seeing all these local crazy operators that have been talking about how successful they've been for the last, say, year or two investing in multifamily. So I can tell you that, thank God those people are no longer promoting themselves on Facebook, so that's a good thing. But I would look at, at good operators that have a good track record that kind of know what the hell they're doing and are kind of thought leaders. And I consider Neil a thought leader. I've known him for a while. I think that, you know, he, he's, he's in front of the – in front of the curve instead of trying to play catch up. Fritz, anything to add? No, I think uh, both you and Nick kind of hit it right in the head. It's just, um, it's going to be an interesting next three to six months. And I think, uh, you know, hopefully we get through the next, uh, see where how May and June collections come in and hopefully we can get the economy back to work. And so we can have a quicker recovery. Neil, there's a question about and related to education. Someone's asking, when is the next boot camp and will it be online? Uh, the next boot camp is in June, and yes, it will be online, though we've expanded it. So we used to do six sessions over two weeks. Uh, we've now found that given the circumstances, asset management is a very big deal. So Anna's added a huge amount of asset management content. So it's now eight sessions. So it's Monday, eight Tuesday, sessions, Wednesday, yeah. and Thursday, two, two weeks. Well, they, t they end up being more like two yeah. and a half hours. Three hours but the, um, the, yeah. the boot camp is going to be in June. So we're looking forward to going back to our roots of, of teaching boot camps virtually. That's how we started out. Um, and so uh, uh, if you go to multifamilyu.com and click on the boot camp link, you'll see more information there. We'll be sending more information out about that. I do think, I do think that the syndication model will persevere. Like Paul, I'm happy to see that you know, folks that barely had a stubble and, and were buying $20 million buildings, you know, are, are beginning to go away. Um, so there's going to be some common sense to it. I think what will happen is that syndication is going to, some of the people that are coming into syndication now, you're going to come in in a time when you're going to be a little more level-headed. You're probably going to go out and buy 80-unit buildings before you buy 400-unit $50 million buildings, which you could buy, you know, six months ago. And I think that's going to be good for you. It'll, it'll be a, a good way for you to get started a little bit slower rather than just starting with a bazooka as, as people have done. And that now some of those people are in serious, serious trouble. So I do think it's a good time to be in syndication. You just have to be a little more, a uh, little less head in the sky at this point in time. And I, I think the environment will help you be a little more grounded. So we're actually going to take the last minutes of this. I'm going to give each of you a chance to look through the Q&A or you could, might, there might be something in the chat and choose something that you want to grab onto and answer. I'm, I'm looking. You're looking. And Neil's really good at this. He's always scouring. I did tell Nick and Paul, I gave him a heads up. I'm not sure if Fritz was in there. So Nick, did you, do you see something that you want to jump on? Yeah, I have a quick one that, yeah, I have a oh, quick Nick's one. Nick's ready. So, Sorry, Nick's ready. Nick. Yeah, no, 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 no. Go, go ahead, Neil. Okay. Go, ahead, Neil. Well, well, mine was simple. I mean, somebody said, you know, what about recession-proof mobile home parks and, and um, you know, what was the other thing? Self-storage. So I, first I want to point out, there is no such thing as recession-proof. So both mobile home parks and storages suffered in 2008. There were defaults on both of those asset classes, so they can't be recession-proof. Having said that, those two were the best performing asset classes in 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 real estate in 2008. So, you know, uh, self-storage and mobile home parks. So you've got recession resistant asset classes, but the moment you start thinking that they're recession proof, you've got your head in the clouds. Don't do that because you'll end up overpaying for them. Yeah, you know, one we forgot, so Neil, that no one mentioned was medical. When we were talking about assets coming up, yep. new, uh, assets to look at, medical buildings, and that actually did incredibly well in the last recession as well. I think it was the top, the leader, mm -hmm. right? Um, yep. Over all of them. It was the least certainly, leader. certainly one of the best. And I, yes. I think that one message I want to give people is if you want to look at opportunity, after 2009-11, that was a catastrophic event. For the next 10 years, the sector, the fastest growing sector in the world was security. I believe that at least for the next five years, the fastest growing sector in the, in the world is going to be healthcare. We've, we've received a root awakening yeah. that our world is just as tied to healthcare as it was 20 or 30 or 50 or 100 years ago, right? This is a root awakening. We never built 
an infection control infrastructure in the US, simply because we believe an event like this could not happen. We never built, um, you know, any, I mean, anything related to pandemics. I think that we're gonna see a significant expansion of healthcare, especially when it comes to infection control. And I think there's an opportunity there for medical offices, especially if office ends up not doing well because of the fact that more people are telecommuting, you may have the opportunity to take certain kinds of offices and convert them into medical offices. Okay, who's ready to go? I'll, I'll, add, I'll add just one. Somebody uh, asked earlier and, and I, I commented on it, but I think it's, it's a great, uh, great question about property taxes okay. as it relates to multifamily. Yeah, really I mean, good one. It's interesting because in, in all of our research and different surveys that we do at various points in time, you know, many, you know, five, six years ago, every investor's biggest concern was interest rate risk. And then rates kept not going up forever. And so people finally got over that and, and, and then uh, everybody shifted to property tax risk. Um, and so, of course, everybody's wondering right now, What's going to happen with property taxes um, this year? Uh, the, the short answer is like the 1031 uh, legislation, which is obviously more federal, um, whereas property taxes are at the state level. Uh, certainly in Texas and, and many other, um, you know, many other uh, states, it's it's a it's a significant thing and it's coming up fast on us. So yeah, I, I have I've heard from our uh, property tax consultants that we use that it is. Um, you know, they're, they're having active dialogue with the uh, appraisal districts and, and the taxing authorities, and they're trying to, uh, trying to figure out what to, what to do with it. Again, there's no clarity Great yet, question. but again, that's a, that's a huge variable in the valuation of all of these deals. And no deal has been made in the last you know, few years without people getting pretty aggressive with how they're, they're you know, underwriting their property taxes, especially in Texas. So um, so I would say stay tuned for that. I think that's coming soon. As of now, all the, the same deadlines are still in place. Um, so those assessments will, will be coming out, you know, potentially in the next few weeks. But they're technically as of January 1. And obviously this uh, crisis didn't hit us until after that. So, uh, so it's going to be really an interesting uh, thing to see. But again, that's just another variable right now that we just don't have clarity on. So we'll get some clarity on that, I think, in, in the next two or three weeks. We just launched a poll that we uh, should have launched a few minutes ago. Thank you, Neil, for launching that. We'd love for you to um, answer our poll. It's very quick while we um, continue to take responses. And uh, Paul or Fritz, are you ready to grab onto a question? Nick, why don't you see if you can find another one? That was a great one. Mm -hmm. um, I should look at the Q&A box, right? There's some good yep, ones there. There's some good ones in there. All right, I don't have a... I don't have a, a, a answer to the question, but I have a, an opinion that yes. I throw out there. So okay. my personal opinion is that I would think that we're going to come out of this in the next 12 months or so. And what that means is the country gets back to work in segments and gradually over the next four months. And I believe the shock that, uh, that we have is going to throw us into a recession for probably about 24 months, I would imagine. So everybody in the real estate community knew that there was something out there that was going to create a recession. You know, whether it's a big recession or a small recession, I, I mean, I don't know. But we didn't know what it is. But today, we know what the hell it was. <laughs> so, yep. we, Yeah, uh, we've all been so waiting, right? We've all been waiting for this, this thing to come up. But I would say my personal opinion, again, is raise liquidity. Stay in front of the real estate brokers just like Nick. Build your buying group of who you want to have on your team. And if you own, communicate with your bankers and loan servicers and communicate the hell as much as you can information over to them so they know that uh, you can be trusted with a bigger transaction next mm -hmm. time. That's it. Makes sense. Uh, and I want to take one, but I want to first start off by saying uh, I am, I resonate with Paul. I've seen a lot of commentary from Marcus and Millichap and, and CBRE and, and Berkadia that we may be out of a recession in Q2 and Q3 and Q4. And they've got some phenomenal, uh, analysts, but I, I feel that this is going to be a longer recession. The damage that we did to the world economy in many ways is irreversible. And, and so the world economy is roughly a $100 trillion economy. So it's about $10, billion, $10 trillion a month. And we basically took two months of that out. $20 trillion vanished 
And yes, we can print some money, but money that's printed is also a loan, right? You, you, when you print money, you loan it into existence. So it's, it's not free money. So you can't take a $20 trillion hit and be back in two quarters. I think that so far, the people that are thinking that this is a two quarter recession are sugarcoating it. So I, I, wanna, I wanna say that I, I, I agree with Paul there. I have a question here. Neil, I've seen a couple of your deal presentations. You've used bridge loans. Are you concerned about the loans coming due without completing your business plan and not being able to reach projected returns for your investors? If so, what's your plan? Uh, yeah, I've, I've used bridge loans in a number of deals. Uh, the short answer is that those deals are on track. So it's very unlikely that my lenders, whenever I need to extend my bridge loans, it's very unlikely that those lenders will actually at, you know, ask me or, or will, will not trigger an extension. Secondly, some of my projects are ahead of track yes. and I'm really looking forward to if, you know, if I don't sell them and I probably won't sell them in this environment, I'm going to go to Fritz and say, here's my project. I am on track. I want those sub 4% loans that Fritz has been talking about, right? Because yeah. I've been working hard for those. So, so those are the sort of things that people like Fritz are open to because the property shows a clear track record. You bought it here, you increase rents. I don't think that that market is frozen in any way. And I don't, I don't even think there's an impact. In fact, I think I'm going to get lower um, you know, rates there than I projected in my performa year, year and a half ago because nobody saw sub 4% interest rates. Fritz, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, there's still plenty of capital. Um, you know, I would say in the next six to nine months, there's going to be additional reserves. And, but I still think you should be able to, you know, do a cash out refinance, take return some of your equity. I think the, the lenders will want to make sure that you still have, you know, at least 10 to 20% equity still remaining in the deal. But, you know, you're completely right. I mean, no one really saw rates, um, you know, where they are today. I mean, uh, if you would have told me the 10 year treasury, you know, about a year ago would have been at, you know, 70 basis points or 50 basis points when it was, I think ever at that point, you know, in the end of 2018, we thought it was at three and a quarter and we thought we'd be at four or 5% in the coming yep. year or two. And it's done the complete reversal. So, you know, their money is really cheap right now. If you have good projects with good sponsors that have, have a proven track, track record, there's plenty of liquidity in that market. Yeah. I don't think that that's where the problems are. If your, pro if your property is are performing, I, I think that you're in a good place today. To be honest, I think I'm in a better place. So sort of weirdly, I feel like I'm glad I bought these properties when I did because now pe the next guy that's looking to buy properties, I may not be able to sell them easily, but I can hold them easily and they have a lot of value because the next guy can't buy at, at any reasonable sort of price with all the impounds that Freddie and Fanny are putting on them. Well, yes. guys, anyone have any more they want to latch on to? The one uh, I saw just quickly, I think there was an underwriting question where how Fannie and Freddie are underwriting collections. Great. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll answer that one. Uh, I think you asked if there's 15% across the board. I mean, the guidance that we've received from, from, from Fannie and Freddie essentially are stating that, you know, we're going to underwrite just income in place in the coming months. And I think as we see how April and May come in, um, I think they could tweak that, whether that's, you know, they underwrite to trailing one month in May um and be a little more draconian i think it also depends on the sponsorship and location and leverage um i think there's their underwriting is going to become less programmatic and maybe more deal specific and so i think as you look at deals you know be, be in touch with your mortgage broker and your lender to making sure that uh you're getting these deals underwritten up front mm -hmm. makes sense makes a lot of sense awesome um wow uh, thank you all for staying with us. There's over 425 of you an hour and a half later. Uh, a lot of that is because many of you know, you know, Paul and Nick and understand the value of these sorts of professionals spending time with you. Um, to be honest, I learned a lot. There's, there's a yeah. lot of interesting stuff here. And, you know, one of the things I'd love to do, Paul and, 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 and Nick and Fritz, is, is do a redo of this 60 days from now. I mean, that would be marvelous right? to come back yeah. and say, let's do a sequel okay. of this town hall and see how, yeah. uh, how those 60 days went. And, and, you know, what did we actually see based on our predictions? I, I think it would be phenomenal to do a sequel to this. Yeah, let's I agree because a lot of it was kind of like, up. What's, yep. you know, hey, what's going on out there? It's like, eh, everything's kind of frozen. Everything's kind right. of stopped. I wouldn't look at deals now. So, it, you know, I, I'd love to do that. You know, let's say 45 days out, 60 days out, we'll figure out the right timing. Part two. Yeah. Yep. Let's do it. You know, Nick and I and Fritz Sounds are great. deal makers in that, you know, we, we want to put deals together, but right now it's the tap, it's tapped the, the break a little bit. Let's take a look and see what's going on just for a little bit. 
And uh, you know, we appreciate everybody's time coming on tonight. And uh, I know that uh, you got some, some great talent in the room. And so uh, we appreciate uh, being part of it. Absolutely. All right, thanks, thanks everybody. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Stay safe. Bye. Thank you. See ya.